All right, hi. I am Dr. Sandra Musial, and I'm gonna be doing this lifestyle medicine talk on whole food plant-based nutrition, optimizing human health with the proper fuel. Can you guys see the slides okay? Okay. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my most recent endeavor is the founder and president of Plant Docs as a food as medicine specialist. I was originally board certified in pediatrics and then more recently became board certified in obesity medicine. And this past summer, I did the culinary coaching certification at Harvard um, to help teach cooking. I'm, I was the assistant clinical professor of pediatrics at Brown for the last 11 years. And before that, I was in private practice for 13 years. I do have an undergraduate degree in nutrition, and I've also studied plant-based nutrition from um, E. Cornell, and I did a year of Institute of Integrated Nutrition coaching, and um, I'm also, a, or was a board certified lactation consultant, but I'm not doing that anymore. So I have a lot of expertise in breastfeeding, and I love gardening. I started a garden at um, Hasbro Children's Hospital. I don't have any financial holdings that promote any particular product. So one quote that I love that kind of defines what I'm doing now is the food you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine, or it can be the slowest form of poison. So when you're eating, every bite you take is a choice. <clears throat> this is a spectrum, and here are the two ends of the spectrum, but the foods on the left are a, A plus foods, they're in their whole state, fruits and vegetables from the earth that are clean and they're nourishing for your body, healing. Each of them gives you gifts that your body needs. Whereas the foods on the right are feeding disease. They, are, they cause inflammation in the body and that lead to disease states like obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers, autoimmune diseases. So when you're trying to choose what food you wanna eat, I decided to look up the definition. And here are a couple, food is a product eaten regularly by a group that has recognized its harmlessness and long-term benefits for health. So food should be harmless. It shouldn't be causing cardiovascular disease. Webster said any nutritious substance that people or animals eat in order to maintain life. So a food that's leading to an early death or causing cancer is not really a food. So breast milk, um, this going back to my roots of breastfeeding, is the optimal food for a human baby, human milk. And one of the things that, just to give you a little perspective, is when, when people like, we've gotten away from breastfeeding and we're, people were really formula feeding in like the 80s and 90s, and we're trying to get back to breastfeeding. But people still think about it, and even physicians think about it as, what are the benefits of breastfeeding, trying to convince a mom to breastfeed? And they say things like, oh, it lowers your risk of um, ear infections and um, autoimmune diseases and obesity. And you know, it's a big long list of how breast milk reduces these risks. But really in reality, it's, they should be breastfeeding anyway, right? This is the optimal milk for the human baby. When you feed them formula, it's increasing their risks of all these conditions. So we're really, and, and people like, don't wanna like, ooh, you don't wanna insult somebody that's choosing to formula feed, but that's really the, um, the reality is that formula feeding increases risk. So I think of the same thing with food. What is the optimal food for a human being? And which foods are we choosing to eat that are not acting as a healing medicinal foods, but are causing disease? So food is medicine is this kind of, branch of science and medicine where we can become more educated as physicians about the power of food to heal. So you literally are what you eat. You know, our cells turn over and we need to make new cells all the time. And where do we get the building blocks for these new cells? You know, it comes from the breakdown products of the food you eat. And people say, oh, well, what's the difference between like 100 calories of broccoli or 100 calories of Oreos? <coughs> And there, there is um, a big difference because it's the, you know, the nutrients and the details um, within each of those calories that makes a difference in the health of your cells. So when you're eating, you're not just feeding yourself and your stomach, but you're feeding the cells in your body and the trillions of bacteria in your gut. 
So if you had a Lamborghini and you had to choose what fuel to use, there's not a lot of options out there. There's just like different rated octane gasolines. Even if this were your car, still the option, you're gonna put some kind of gasoline in the car. You're not gonna choose to put soda in your car. Your car is not gonna last very long if you put um, a soda in your car and our bodies likewise don't do well when it not fed the proper fuel. It's a lot more confusing with humans. There's all kinds of misinformation and hyperinformation out there that's shoving all different kinds of theories down people's throats about um, metabolism and different options. The government doesn't make it any easier because there's so much lobbyists supporting the meat industry, the milk industry, the corn industry with high fructose corn syrup. So it can be very confusing for people to really know. And when sometimes when you start to read about it, it gets more and more confusing. So sometimes looking at globally what different cultures do and then what their disease states are in these population studies can be helpful. This is a Life magazine study a number of years ago that looked at a typical family in the country and what they ate in one week. And I just think this is fascinating, this family of nine or 11, however many people, children are in there. But you can see they're eating local foods, grown locally, mostly whole food, plant-based, um, not, not a lot of junk. And this Turkish family, this is what they're eating in a week. And you can see lots of fruits and vegetables and oranges and homemade breads, not so many processed foods. But this was the American family of four and what they ate in a week. And almost everything is in a package, a box with a label and not in its whole, um, whole form. So of the 2 million species on the planet, only three have a problem with their weight. Obviously, humans are one of them. If you think about what the other two might be, um, it becomes obvious that our pets are victims of, of the way that we um, eat the wrong kinds of food and don't get enough exercise. So just a few words on the um, obesity epidemic in the United States. These are some interesting graphs that you may have seen previously, starting in 1985 and, and spanning the years to um, 2010. And the black is no data. The light blue is less than 10%. The medium blue um, is 10 to 14. And first, there's not a lot of data. More and more states, 86, 87, 88, 89. You see more and more of the um, 10 to 14% states covering the country. And now in 1991, we start with the 15 to 19% obesity rate category. Um, it always starts in Mississippi, Louisiana, and West Virginia, interestingly. Michigan is not far behind. And now we have in 1994, all of the states are greater than 10, um, the 10 to 14%, and a lot of them are 15 to 19%. 95, 96, 97, greater than 20%, 98, 99, 2000, and almost everyone's in that 20 to 24 category. We now have 25 to 29%, and now greater than 30%, 2006, 2007, 2008. And then in 2010, we have um, 14 states that have an obesity rate 20 to 24% in that yellow category, and every other state is greater than 25 or 30%. And then, sorry, but the colors change um, on this CDC obese. These are all from the CDC. Um, 10 years later, um, only three states are in that 20 to 24 category. And now there's a, um, a 35 to 40% category, and they're getting ready for the 40, greater than 40% category. So you can see this is an ap epidemic that just grew crazily out of control over the last 30 years. And along with it, there was an increase um, in type two diabetes, a six fold increase in the last 40 years. That's one in 10 American adults. It's so common that C. Everett Coop coined the term diabetes, increasing the awareness about the cause of um, obesity leading to diabetes. So, I'm sure you're familiar with the hemoglobin A1C and how the glucose sticks to the um, red blood cell, which is yellow for in this picture, no good reason. Um, 
And when too much of it sticks, that's how they measure um, prediabetes and diabetes. And so prediabetes is that 5.7 to 6.4 range and diabetes is greater than 6.5. So prediabetes, approximately 84 million American adults, more than one out of three has prediabetes. And of those, over 84% don't know they have it. So people aren't being tested for this. They're just not aware of how much of a problem it is. So what is the cause of diabetes? We have um, intracellular fat. When people gain weight, they're gaining weight, not just around their belly, but also within their cells and in their organs. And when you have fat buildup in your cells, these intramyocellular lipid globules interfere with the, the signaling of the insulin. So where insulin would normally unlock and let the glucose into the cell, these patients are making plenty of insulin, but it's not functioning properly. And the good news is as they lose weight, they, the fat comes out of the cell and the cell can regain its functioning back. That's good news. So there's also an uh, increase in rate of heart disease over the same time period and an incredible increase in autoimmune diseases. These are trends in the incident rates of invasive and in situ female breast cancer in this over the same period of time. And um, so you get the point, all these chronic diseases um, and cancer um, during, the, during this period of time has been all going up along with the um, obesity and the quality of food and nutrition in the country during this time has been going down. More and more processed foods, fast foods and less eating whole foods. So the traditional medical doctor allopathic approach to chronic medical conditions is in pills, giving pills. And hypertension, you know, commonly people end up on lisinopril, high cholesterol, they end up on Lipitor, Crestor, and type two diabetes are, is often treated with metformin. And these things, sometimes doctors will recommend diets, but it's very hard to change behavior in patients. Um, so I think a lot of doctors give up and you give the pill and it corrects the numbers. And, and we've gotten into this habit of not really figuring out a good solution on how to educate um, patients on how diet can have an impact. And even surgical approaches are, are more common than these dietary interventions. In pre-COVID, the um, the um, sleeve gastrectomy was performed 250,000 times in 2018 as an intervention for, for severe obesity. And coronary artery disease, we performed 240,000. So about the same um, number of bypass surgeries for coronary artery disease. So as physicians, are we providing sick care or health care? Um, sick care is like damage control like these with the surgeries and the pills, healthcare is really a wellness perspective, proactively creating true health by preventing disease through healthy lifestyle style choices. So as healthcare workers, we're at a fork in a road where we can choose, you know, which way do you wanna go? How do you wanna treat your, your patients? Is this the pills and surgery line is how, you know, what's been happening. And this, this guy at the lifestyle change booth is really bored. I think we need to put a lot more emphasis as um, all physicians, but specifically primary care physicians on focusing on lifestyle change. So what do doctors want for, um, for in order to make a change and make rec recommendations? And we really wanna see placebo controlled double blind studies. And it's um, very hard to do with nutrition. You've got to kind of lock people in a room for 30 years and you know, feed them to really know how it's going to you know, affect some of these chronic long-term conditions. It's not realistic. Many studies are observational and do not show cause and um, causal, um, but do show significant relationships. And um, population studies are very intriguing. They show important relationships between dietary patterns within different countries and disease prevalence, and they need to be, um, I think, acknowledged. So this is kind of a cool little chart that just shows, compares some of the, um, the different diets, Western, healthy US, Mediterranean versus plant-based. And, 
one second. So the Western diet is, is that family that they were showing you with the excessive um, plant-based, um, the excessive processed foods, a lot of meats and dairy, um, sugars, butters, sweetened beverages. Healthy U.S. diet, where people say, oh, I'm going to take the skin off the chicken. I'm not going to fry in bad oil. I'm going to use skim milk and maybe introduce more whole grains and eat more, a lot of like Diet Coke, you know, but this isn't really working. Mediterranean diet has gotten a lot of great positive press because it's better than these two previous kind of dietary patterns. Um, there's a lot more beans and um, low fat meats like fish in that diet, some cheeses, more whole grains, olive oil, um, and lots of fruits and veggies, which is great. And a plant-based diet has kind of the same as Mediterranean, but you take out the cheese and the poultry and the fish. Um, and oils are used very sparingly in small amounts. So let's see. Oh, and then this is an important distinction between plant-based and vegan. So vegan is really more of an ethical choice to not eat any animal products. Um, so it's like the red X on the meat and poultry, seafood and eggs, but a plant-based diet, it's more a healthy choice about eating. It's more a lifestyle and a way of eating rather than um, an absolute, I can't have it. So they might avoid these things. Um, and then the other differences down here between oils and highly processed foods, <coughs> a whole food plant-based diet would not use any oils and avoid highly processed foods altogether, where a plant-based diet might include oils. So we're in the programs that I'm running, we're teaching a whole food plant-based diet because it seems like the optimal diet for humans. So I'm just gonna go over 12 landmark studies um, that I think are important very quickly, just like one slide per um, study. And this one is 30 years old by Dean Ornish. Um, you might've heard about this in your, rot I know your rotation just started, right? So, um, but this is like not, in not new information. This is 30 years old that he determined eating a whole food plant-based diet can actually take plaque out of coronary arteries and reverse coronary artery disease in the lifestyle heart trial. And this study was also um, carried out by Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, who wrote Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And he put his patients who were end-stage heart disease on a low-fat, whole food plant-based diet. And this was after um, 18 months. It shows this cardiogram of the diseased coronary artery opening up in one particular patient. But, but it's very striking. And um, I think we could do more with this. So this was, a, um, this was published um, in JAMA in 2013, looking at the number one contributor to death in the United States, the 17 leading risk factors. Dietary risk factors is the number one contributor to death when you compare even stacked against um, tobacco smoking and high blood pressure and these other risk factors. It has a profound impact on um, mortality. This is a meta-analysis um, published in 2018 that um, looks at risks for cardiovascular disease. So this um, vertical line is kind of neutral and everything to the left of the line is, is a, a positive um, thing for cardiovascular disease where everything to the right is more causative. So like processed meats, and refined grains, processed meats by far is the worst as far as a contributor to cardiovascular disease. Um, sweetened sugar beverages is the SSB and the Western diet in general. These are contributors to cardiovascular disease. And then to the left are things that, you know, might have some benefit. Um, and, and as you go further to the left, there's more evidence. So the furthest things on the left are pr a prudent diet, a Mediterranean diet, where people are really cutting out processed foods and sugary baked goods, um, nuts, whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. And then there's some good data on coffee and tea. <laughs> So this is um, a vegetarian dietary patterns and heart disease. Um, healthy lifestyle choices may reduce the risk um, 
I'm going to move my little picture, um, of myocardial infarction by 80% with nutrition playing a key role. The vegetarian dietary patterns reduce mortality and risk of coronary artery disease by um, 40%. And plant-based diets have been shown to be the only dietary pattern to have shown reversal of um, coronary heart disease. Blocked arteries are unblocked partially or fully in as many as 91% of patients. It's very big. Oops. So how quick can you reverse cardiovascular disease? It's actually very quick. You can start to see changes. In this study, over four weeks, they had 31 participants eating a low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet. And this is basically what I do in this program that I'm running. Um, and we measure blood pressure before and after, cholesterol before and after. Um, and they, they're seeing reductions in blood pressure, drop in serum lipids, um, decrease in medication usage, and um, you know, decrease in other cardiovascular disease risk factors. So the Mediterranean diet, this is a study with 25, almost 26,000 women from the Women's Health Study, followed over 12 years, measuring 40 different biomarkers. Those with the highest Mediterranean intake had up to 28% less cardiovascular disease. And you know, I love the Mediterranean diet. It's mostly plant-based, legumes, whole grains, and fruits and vegetables. So type two diabetes, these are studies looking at that. This is reversible on a whole food plant-based diet. This was a study of um, 7,400 participants from a 55,000 um, number of participants, age 50 to 65 from the Danish diet cancer and health cohort. And they looked at um, daily intake of whole high fiber whole grains, including rye bread, oatmeal, and whole grain breads. It lowered the risk for type two diabetes by 11% for men and 7% for women per serving. A lot of people think, oh, you can't have carbs if you have diabetes. And it's really related to that fat, not the carbs. So plant-based diet and type two diabetes. This is a review of 11 trials on plant-based diet and diabetics. Plant-based diet improved well-being overall when compared to dietary interventions from various diabetes associations. Subjects reported less pain, saw improvements in depression, weight, quality of life, cholesterol, and their A1C levels. Um, and they had really good adherence. So it's very positive. Um, gluten and type two diabetes. And this was from that huge nurses health study. You've probably learned in other classes, but um, there was 11 to 20% less type two diabetes as the amount of gluten containing carbs increased. So the conclusion was that gluten intake is inversely associated with type two diabetes risk among largely healthy US men and women. And this is looking at longevity. 11,000 participants in the NHANES 3 study, they developed a score, an index um, that scored plant-based and animal-based foods differently to, um, because not all vegetarian and plant-based diets are the same. They're, so this is really looking at the quality of the food that they were eating. Um, so if, if for every um, 10 unit increase in this index was associated with a 5% lower risk of all cause more mortality in the overall study population, which is pretty profound. And living shorter, the opposite, um, 44,000 participants tracked mortality rates. They looked at um, the consumption of ultra processed foods, um, which mean defined with increased salt, sugar, and saturated fat and less fiber in these ultra processed foods. For every 10% more ultra processed foods eaten, there was a 14% increased risk of death from hypertension, cancer, obesity, and dyslipidemia. <coughs> so this um, concept of food as medicine is not new. Um, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food over um, 2000 years ago. This is my garden. So um, Dr. Esselstyn, I'm stealing this from, from a talk he gave, but he said, you know, what if there was a magic pill? Cause us doctors like to prescribe pills. It's what we do and what we learn about. One pill that made you um, 
helped you to lose weight, reduced your blood pressure, reduced your cholesterol, and helped cure your diabetes. Like that one pill that did all that, it would be the most popular pill in America. But every pill has side effects. So what are the side effects of this medication? Well, taking this pill will make you sleep better, have increased energy, better sexual function, clearer skin, and you're gonna lose weight on it for um, not you know, unnecessary weight, the excess weight. And then people say, well, what, what would this cost, this pill? It must be very expensive. If it does all that, it sounds like a magic pill and it doesn't cost any more than you're spending now. So I use this kind of um, analogy when I talk to patients about like trying to compare pills and diet um, this is the magic pill. It has, you know, all the food that you eat that can be medicinal and help with all of these conditions. I like to really stress that it's not a diet. A diet is something you go on, then you go off, like yo-yo, on and off. This is evidence-based medicine. It's a way of life, a way of eating. It's a choice, choosing foods that are healthy for you. So, we teach this whole food plant-based um, nutrition as the optimal fuel for humans with no added sugar, oil, or salt. And um, the only thing really missing from this diet is vitamin B12 because it's found in um, bacteria that, um, sorry, I have to get the dog, um, that animals eat. And it's found in meats and eggs. So it's you really it's hard to get in sufficient quantities in a plant-based, whole food plant-based diet. So we recommend being on a supplement. So what's in this magic pill? Lots of veggies. Getting, you know, recommendations are for nine servings per day of, of fruits and veggies combined. Leafy greens, a variety of color, cruciferous veggies, mushrooms, the allium family, onions, garlic, all of them offer different gifts for the body, different nutrients. Eat more fruits. Berries in particular have the highest antioxidant levels of all the fruits. So including berries specifically as part of the fruits in the diet is important. Eat legumes. Legumes are an important source of fiber and protein in a whole food plant-based diet and should be consumed two to three times per day. And whole grains, also three servings per day in the whole form, not refined. Eat nuts and seeds for healthy fats in addition to like avocados um, and olives. So I just, just got the time. Oh, we're doing good. So germ-free mice, this is a study that, um, have you guys seen this study with the, um, yeah? I'm just gonna um, um, summarize what happened. You have these germ-free mice that are born into sterile conditions by C-section, fed sterile food and water and live in a sterile cage. And then they're introduced um, to the to biome, the gut biome and the poop from other mice that are either normal, obese or underweight. They smear it on their fur and the mice lick it off and it becomes their gut biome. And without changing the amount of calories that they're eating, the mice that get the obese flora become obese and the mice that get the underweight flora lose weight. And so it tells you there's, there's more to uh, metabolism and weight maintenance than calories in, calories out. There's way more at play happening with hormones and gut bacteria um, and um, neurobiology. So what the um, good bacteria does for you, it, you know, it affects the body in different ways. It can decrease the number of calories that are absorbed in your body, um, which would explain why the skinny mice might lose, skinny mice poop might lose weight, decreases fat storage, it decreases um, inflammation and endotoxin production, increases the mucus layer in the gut, increases enzymes in the gut that make you feel full and boosts your immune system. So having a healthy gut biome is really important to having a healthy body. And this little diagram at the right just shows how um, the healthy microbial um, bacteria in your gut 
produce different um, short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, butyrate. And then these in turn um, are absorbed and affect different things in your body. body. Um, they increase certain enzymes in your gut that increase your satiety level. At a cellular level, they, um, they affect the cell decrease insulin sig signaling, decrease fat accumulation. It's, it's, it's complicated, but the, um, the gut biome plays a critical role in metabolism and weight um, maintenance. So how do you get good bacteria? Here's um, a interesting food pyramid I found that talks about just healthy um, gut health. <coughs> and at the bottom with the most that you should be eating are fresh cooked and fermented vegetable lots of fruits, legumes, bean, tofu, tempeh, some whole grains, rice, pasta, sourdough, um, and a few nuts, fats, and healthy oils. So natural sources of probiotics are um, eating fermented foods. And every culture tends to have its own fermented food. These are just, this is the Korean kimchi on the left, um, Japanese miso and German Eastern European sauerkraut made from um, red cabbage and, and um, regular cabbage. But this is a way to introduce natural bacteria, um, healthy, good bacteria. And also eating um, foods from this pyramid help feed the good bacteria and they've done studies looking if, you, if you're eating a lot of um, dairy and meat and not a lot of variety of fruits and vegetables, you end up with a less diverse um, gut biome and the kinds of bacteria in your gut that promote weight gain and disease states as opposed to the kind that protect you. So the good news is you can change your gut biome by changing your diet. So this is um, Plant City that um, inspired me to start um, my company called Plant Docs that um, I actually quit my regular doctor job in June to do this full time and to help educate people on the importance of um, food on, and health and the choice of food. So we run this program called Jumpstart Your Health. There are three MDs, um, the other two are board certified in family medicine, and we had nutrition educators that were um, certified through the Food for Life um, certification program from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And we started this program where we did the blood work before and after. We had physician appointments before and after where we checked blood pressure, weight, got, um, calculated their BMI, um, did waist circumference. And then we had five two-hour group sessions um, weekly where we did education, cooking demos, tastings, community buildings, answered questions, and then we also interspersed walks or field trips to the grocery store to help people um, learn how to do this. And we just had some really um, profound results. These are um, two of the doctors and the nutrition educator in action. <laughs> and this is one of our groups that, you know, we have people of all ages and sizes and um, it's, it's been really fun and really satisfying because we see these kinds of results. So this is just some of our results, a total cholesterol average um, in our group. Some people are young and healthy, um, so it throws off the averages, but was 192 with an average decrease of 26. The average LDL was 110 with a decrease of 17 over the month. But when you look at only those who had a cholesterol greater than 200, it dropped 41 points. And if you only look at the LDL that, LDLs that were greater than 100, they dropped 22 points. So just by changing what people ate, um, it, we had a very effective um, changes in their um, cholesterols. Weight loss is a nice healthy rate, 4.3 pounds over the course of the program, six pounds if their BMI was greater than 30. So um, this, was, this is a nice healthy kind of one pound a week, one and a half pound a week. So it, the body isn't thinking it's starving and they don't rebound and gain weight afterwards. Um, no one in our program had fatty liver for this data. The um, type two diabetes outcome data um, is hard to do in a one month period because you really need to check your A1C every um, three months. But what was profound was people that did have diabetes 
within a week or two, they had to, we had to have them checking their glucose frequently. They had to um, adjust their, their doses of medication and they had noted in, increased in glucose control. So that's really great. So the whole food plant-based diet um, can do a lot of things and this is what it looks like. Um, I like to think of foods like a grading system, A through F. Um, and A foods are necessary for the human body to function optimally um, at a cellular level. They're in their natural state, unprocessed, unrefined. They're free of artificial ingredients, additives, colorings, chemicals, pesticides. They're not genetically altered and not containing ingredients that have been shown to increase the rates of any diseases. You know, so they're real food. So um, this was Alana Puldi and Matthew Letterman made this um, A through F thing that I think simplifies it and people really like thinking about it like this. So I like personally try to eat A and B foods um, most of the time. So like A plus foods are whole fruits and vegetables, legumes and whole grains. A foods are minimally processed whole foods. So maybe an example would be like chickpea pasta, whole grain bread, um, nuts and seeds and avocado here because they're more calorically dense. Um, a minus foods are refined grains or nut milks and B foods are plant-based foods that are processed. But I argue that some of them are in the C category like some of the um, new burgers that are being mass produced all over the country have a lot of coconut oil in them and I would put them more in the C category. But there can be some really healthy um, vegan burgers out there that are made with lots of veggies and beans and those would be more B or even A like if I make it myself. C's are oils and sugars, um, sugary drinks, sports drinks, D are animal products, dairy products, chicken fish, red meat, eggs, and F are the worst foods. They're most inflammatory and disease promoting. They're um, fried foods, sorry. Um, mm -mm. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, burgers and things, you know, made in unhealthy fats. So um, this is one uh, resource that you can share with patients. It's called, it's an app, it's free. It's called the Daily Dozen app and Dr. Michael Greger um, created it. And I would encourage you guys to download it yourself and kind of use it and practice so you can see. When you click on it, so this, for example, is three servings of beans per day, one serving of berries, three servings of other fruits besides the berries. And if you click on it, it will tell you what a serving size is and more information. It's just very user-friendly. And for someone who has no idea how to get started, it's a great resource. Reading nutrition labels is important. And I go over this with, you know, in our groups, um, stressing, um, you know, minimizing, fat and reading nutrient lab in, um, ingredient labels. Important to just the first three ingredients have the most. So to focus on that and make sure the first three ingredients have no oil, sugar, or refined um, products if you wanna buy packaged food. So I'm just gonna go through some examples of what a whole food plant-based diet looks like with a bunch of food that I've made or, or um, borrowed from the internet. So like, for example, breakfast, um, I eat a homemade granola every day with berries and almond milk. Green tea has been shown to be very helpful with antioxidants and anti-cancer effects. <clears throat> Tofu scramble with broccolini and red peppers and roasted potatoes. Um, snacks might include um, nuts and seeds, unoil free hummus, or this is in an edamame hummus with the seeded crackers that have no oil. Um, so that those are these are all like A B foods. Other snacks like um, the crudite with um, with dairy free dips, berries, kale chips, roasted kale, avocado, and then soups are something that I make a lot of and teach people to make. They're very easy to make and are a great lunch or snack or dinner depending on you know how much stuff is in them. But um, some miso soup and a butternut squash soup. This butternut squash soup has um, 
some shredded coconut in it and chickpeas. Um, so it's very hearty and filling. This is what, when you're preparing a meal on a whole food plant-based diet, this is kind of the new my plate, but adjusted for um, whole food plant-based where half the plate is fruits and vegetables, a quarter is whole grains and a quarter is legumes. So this is on the left is zucchini rounds that are breaded with flaxseed egg. And a flaxseed egg is when you take a tablespoon of brown flaxseed with three tablespoons of warm water and whip it up and you can use it instead of an egg. So you dip these in the flaxseed egg and then you dip it in a whole wheat breadcrumbs um, and bake them. So it's kind of adjusting things, not frying, you know, not white breadcrumbs, not egg, you know, but you can still make things that are delicious. Hearty salads that have beans and chickpeas and sprouts um, are very healthy. This is our signature dish that we teach. Um, I'm actually gonna be teaching it on Monday that I think you guys can come to. Um, this is our, we call it any bean, any green, any grain. And it's just to give people, it's the, the freedom and the independence to try to, you know, figure out how to make a vegan meal on their own. You just have to pick a bean, pick a green and pick a grain. And then we teach them to make this cashew tahini lemon sauce. That's really amazing. Um, so delicious. And then you can switch up this meal and change the bean out, change the green out. And it's a completely different meal. Chili, this is reinvented um, instead of the traditional chili. Here I made it with um, zucchini and cauliflower, peppers and mushrooms and carrots. And, but I'm using all the regular chili spices and beans. And so it kind of tastes like chili, but with all these cool veggies in it, it's delicious. This is a braised tofu dish with spinach and a quinoa brown rice, a jackfruit sandwich with broccoli slaw roasted Brussels sprouts with farro and mushrooms, roasted root veggies with herbs. Um, I love making burritos. You just leave out the cheese and the sour cream and add more you know, veggies, avocado, cilantro. Salsa is a great um, condiment because it has no oil most of the time. Different mushrooms are super healthy. These are king trumpet mushrooms, grilled plantains. And I developed a mac and cheese recipe that I, I puree cashews with carrots and cauliflower and different spices to make this creamy in like a Vitamixer and then mix it with a, um, with a quinoa based um, or lentil based pasta for kind of like home cooking, you know, comfort food, smoked paprika on top, so good. <coughs> in the summer, you can literally grill anything and it makes it really tasty. Um, and then you can do different things with your grilled vegetables. It's a black bean corn chili, an antioxidant salad that has berries in it and, and walnuts, artichokes. Um, it's so good. And here's an arugula salad with grilled portobello mushrooms. So I'm gonna leave you with this quote um, by me <laughs> that I just think is really important. I feel that it is medical to neglect to not tell your patients that the food they choose to eat is causing their conditions um, or their disease. And it's medical neglect to not tell your patients that the healing foods they should be eating could reverse their diseases with no adverse effects. And patients can do with it what they want, right? They just need to know this is what the case is. And then they can make a choice to continue eating French fries and cheeseburgers. We can't make people eat broccoli and kale and, and beans, but they need to at least know that there's this relationship and maybe help guide them in the right direction to programs and nutritionists that can help them learn um, how to eat healthy. So thank you for listening. <laughs>